would like to welcome everybody to a second webinar on the When This Is Over by Tory Project, where we try to capture uh, the positive side of the new reality of what's going to happen to us when this is over. So, um, today we have a superb guest from the United States, Ben Weber, who's a great mind from Boston and um, pioneered his tools and techniques on people analytics in uh, MIT Media Lab. And he's the founder and CEO of Humanize, a company that provides sensor, social sensor technology to help companies before, become more effective. At work, he provides insight on corporate cultures uh, using data that sheds a lot of light on team dynamics and our own work patterns. And his work focuses on the employee experience, which is extremely important, especially these days, which is all based on uh, social physics. And most importantly, he helps to transform business organizations and uh, operating practices, pointing to how people really work, how they collaborate, how they socialize, and form informal networks, which are as important as the formal structures of any organization. And people analytics is a tool for the future of work. So it brings us to the topic of today's meeting. How will the current circumstances influence the future of work? Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And yes, apologies for the uh, for the delay on this. But I'm, again, I'm glad we could all get together even if uh, even if virtually obviously and um, and obviously that's been more common recently um and so as Morta said I'm, I'm going to talk uh, you know really about um, I say the near-term future of work but then um, maybe even moving more broadly just based on really as a global society our collective experiences over the last you know uh, month and, and then obviously beyond this um, Really what what things are likely to to change um, as we get to back to the workplace and I, I do want to preface this by saying that uh, again I'm going to focus on you know the employee experience how work will change but these things are of course a privilege right and I, I feel like I need to say that up front that there are of course many people um, without jobs or who are struggling or who still today need to physically go into workplaces where they themselves are at risk. And I think it's helpful to keep that in mind as we also think about for a lot of people who don't have to do those things and who are fortunate enough to be able to work from home today. Uh, really using that as, as fuel to help ourselves really value our experiences at work um, as well as our ability to, to think a lot more holistically about our own lives. And I think that that is actually going to feed into um, really how we start to work um, and collaborate moving forward. Um, it, in that, I, I think the biggest thing that a, a lot of us, and, and myself included, have really taken away um, from the the beginning of, of this of this experience um, is just how easy collaboration and interaction is in a physical workplace, that the ability to bump into somebody in the hallway or just tap someone on the shoulder who's sitting near you or have an informal coffee with a coworker, that, that is so valuable and so important and takes care of so many different things and so, many, uh, so much uh, information sharing that typically doesn't raise to the level of we need to have a meeting about it but is still critical for how organizations actually function and how we work. And today we've had to be so focused on and really intentional on the communication and collaboration that we have. Right? And I think there are some positives to that that we should want to continue. The idea that if there's a person who I maybe casually chat with once a month, today I would need to intentionally schedule a conversation with that person for us to have a discussion. And again, when we go back to a physical workplace, that will be more possible to do informally and sort of randomly, right? But it's probably gonna look more like what's on the left in terms of we'll probably be, be wearing masks, maybe a little bit farther apart from each other, but maybe can still have some of what's on the right in terms of just having a, um, you know, just informal personal discussion with some of our coworkers. Um, I do think that people who 
will still work remotely or who maybe will have um, won't be able to be in the office as much for whatever reason, that this intentionality is incredibly helpful for them. Um, what we've seen, not just in companies where we're collecting data on how people interact and collaborate using things like email and chat data, um, but also even uh, internally at our operations at Humanize, what we've seen in terms of people who have previously worked remotely and are obviously continuing to do so now, as well as offices in different locations, this has been incredibly positive in terms of their collaboration with each other in terms of actually people who are remote being far more embedded and engaged in terms of their collaboration patterns um, than they were previously. And so we really do need to try to keep that up as much as possible. And there are great things about the physical workplace that we're going to really enjoy when we get back to, but then also keeping in mind that there might be people for whatever reason who can't physically be there, right? And how can we continue to engage those people by being intentional about the way we communicate. From that intentionality, there's also this opportunity to, to quantify and, and, and not just value, the, value these relationships objectively and just be happy to be able to have an informal coffee with someone who's not a family member. That's a really nice thing. And I think, especially at first, there will be just incredible joy at those moments. To get beyond that, though, to say the company companies really need to value that, right? This isn't just a nice to have, and we can think about things like the workplace. It's not just a cost; it really is an investment. It is an investment in the ability to not think about all these, you know, intentional interactions we need to happen. But because so much of collaboration has been, uh, you know, over the past month plus through these digital channels, through email, through chat, through through video conferencing, right, that it means companies have been able well, will be able to actually quantify here's how much here's what we actually get from having a physical workplace from investing in employee experience making it a better place to work physically as well as through tools here is how that changes how we work and i think that's going to be incredibly positive because it, it moves the discussion around employee experience and around just the entire work environment from again, one of just cost and saving money to one of how can we create the right behaviors? And uh, and I don't just mean in terms of collaboration patterns, but eventually, of course, through things like how does that translate to retention, to performance, and really being able to quantitatively connect those dots in a way that was probably harder for a lot of organizations to do before. Obviously, a lot of this was, this is the focus of my PhD research, it's what I still work on um, at my company today, but I do think there is, I, like we're seeing that trend as well. And I think that will accelerate um, given this transition. Um, and I think one of the reasons, again, is that a lot of us have taken human relationships for granted and just how important that connection is with other people. And I think a lot of us, um, and just, just globally, this has been happening more, have been more open about um, closely interacting with strangers from a distance, sort of emotionally closely interacting with strangers from a distance. Um, and I think that's going to continue you know, in the workplace. The idea that we've now got this window into the lives of our coworkers, right? We've we've seen a lot of our coworkers, you know, through through video now with their kids in the background. And by the way, apologies if uh, uh, I am simultaneously doing this webinar and supposedly taking care of my two kids while my wife is on a different call, right? Um, so we've seen that. And throughout our work lives, we've tried so hard to hide those things. I mean, I remember uh, a couple months ago, I was on a call with the executive team at this very large HR tech company. And, uh, but I had to, again, I had to pick up my son early from school for a variety of reasons. And, um, you know, he interrupted partway through the call and I took care of it, but, you know, it was an interruption. And I got, uh, I, I got through a back channel uh, about a week later, I got some information that yeah, they were really disappointed in the call. They thought it was very unprofessional that we got interrupted. And it was funny because at the time at first, I felt really bad and I was like, oh, I, I should have done a better job. And later I realized these people were just jerks, right? Today, we've all had this experience. We've all had this experience of there are different interruptions and whether that's family members, loved ones, uh, just a, 
you know, the fact that we are, you know, in a pandemic and there's health risks and that that causes stress on everybody. But we've all now had this the shared experience. And I hope and I do believe that as we get back into more of a note of, of something of a new normalcy, that that experience will help us understand that when someone says, I can't go on that business trip because I've, I've got to go um, to my son's soccer game. Or if somebody comes in on a video call and interrupts and there's some noise, um, or I've got to work from home for, you know, for a day because, um, you know, I've got a, you know, my dog's sick. Those are all real things. And everybody has those things. And as companies and as coworkers, we can start to appreciate that in much more detail and be able to really bring much more of our whole selves to work, as well as we've known over time that, of course, our work lives and personal lives have really been bleeding into each other. And this is sort of accelerated now. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to appreciate that and not just the flexibility at work itself, but really our ability to integrate these different parts of our lives will be that much richer um, as we get back. So I can talk a lot more. I know we want to leave a lot of time for questions. So maybe we'll uh, I'll, I'll turn back over to, to Marta. And, I, and again, feel free to chime in, in the chat. Um, again, happy to expound more, but thought I would open it up at this time. OK, well, we're looking for um, participants to raise questions, but um, none of them are brave enough already. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe that's not going to change. I don't think that is maybe going to change so much. But uh, in terms of people being <laughs> being braver with uh, asking questions of webinars, I, I just, but feel free to type it in. Yeah, it's it's um, always, it's yeah, probably Marta, always the first one. It's always probably the first one that is that is um, that is uh, <laughs> the toughest. So, um, one of the things your comp what your company does is you have these fantastic sensor badges. Uh, a lot of our participants don't know. What that looks like is the size of a credit card and it um, records a lot including conversations and uh, one of the things when we've met three years back one of the things we've discussed was the data protection and and privacy as a general uh, issue because people now not only have you allowed your company to look at the back of your uh, apartment more or less and to have an insight into your life but the data, the digital breadcrumbs, as you say, that that are all collected through uh, through the, the the communication we use. How to ensure that it's not used against us, which I think is a concern. Yeah, no, I, I do think that's that's a concern. Um, and, and I think that it's been interesting because I was in a call yesterday and some people were suggesting that maybe our notions of privacy have changed just because um, you know, we're in a pandemic and giving information to, um, to companies or to governments so that they can better manage the pandemic is possibly a good thing. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that sentiment. Um, I think that there are real concerns around privacy where in obviously a high risk situation, there are certain things that um, need to be done, but that uh, to your point, a lot of the information that we use is very sensitive, right? Again, what we're looking at is things not like content, but um, again, flows of communication between different teams. I mean, in terms of sensor data, to your point, um, we have some sort of next generation IDs uh, that we've developed that we still use for research. Um, but at a much broader level, um, what we're using and what companies increasingly use are, you know, sensors in the workplace to really understand um, well, a lot of times they're for things as simple as letting you order coffee from your from your desk, but that kind of data can help us sort of estimate face-to-face -face interaction. Again, not even looking at, at conversations, but looking at patterns of co-location and then relating that to all this different data. The question is, to your point, is we've let companies into our lives because this is an extraordinary circumstance, right? But I don't believe that that should necessarily compromise our privacy principles moving forward um, in that things like should, you know, companies, well, again, I can talk about what we do, but we provide companies metrics at a team and higher level, right? So you can't see what is person A doing a 2 3 on Tuesday, right? Because who cares, right? There's not really a good business justification for that. Um, I have seen, I guess recently there's been an uptake in companies installing software that like takes screenshots of your computer 
right? Or takes video such that. And, and again, it's that that is incredibly moronic. Like if your people are doing the work that you're paying them for, how they get it done, frankly, is none of your business. If you're paying them, right, to to give you a report, for example, and it takes them one hour to do that, but you thought it took them eight hours, that is not their fault, right? On top of that, the idea that people have many competing priorities right now, so needing to take 30 minutes to take care of your kid or get them squared away for a lesson, that is a perfectly reasonable use of your time. You're going to be more effective um, in general if you do that. Beyond that, a lot of the, again, the things that predict performance for, for companies, it's not how many hours do you spend writing emails, it's how are you collaborating, how are you enabling the people that you work with to be better? And that is not about just FaceTime or time in front of the computer. That is about me just calling up a coworker. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, even at my company, right? We have informal, we sort of pan, uh, pair random people up for lunch at this point once a week, and we have a virtual lunch with each other, right? Now we're eating lunch, we're just having conversations. We're pretty much not talking about work at this point, but that is work right? in that me building trust with my coworkers is incredibly important in the long term. It's incredibly important for us to be able to share unique information. And, and so I think companies that go in that direction are really going to be, uh, be be punished, not just in the, you know, maybe from a privacy perspective in the legal realm, but more people aren't going to want to work there. And it's actually going to negatively impact performance, even if people keep staying there. And I, I do think the, this again it's sort of ironic because there is i believe this push to value human relationships and we've been experiencing that and i do think part of that is around this kind of data that we're talking about in terms of making these kpis that companies are managed on but i still think that is at higher levels at aggregate levels group team levels it's not about a single person and i think that is much more valid and a lot less of a risk from a privacy perspective okay um, we have another question, but it's 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 related to the topic. So we have seen at least in Europe, uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing. We've seen at least in Europe how people have privileged health against freedom in this special moment. Do you think that we are at the risk when this is over of losing a part of our freedom um, in the sense of uh, our data? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, see, because I, I wouldn't phrase it that way, and it, I understand people who phrase it that way. I mean, it, you know, in some sense, like, am I free to, I mean, in Massachusetts, where I live, in the state in the U.S., um, obviously we have lots of problems in the U.S., but I am technically free. I could go out, I could walk outside without a mask, I could go to my neighbor's house, I could do that. Um, I am free to do that. Um, and even, But I am essentially impinging on other people's freedoms to be healthy. Right? Like I could infect them. I'm going to be fine. It's not about me. It's about the bigger group. Leaving that to the side for a second, we could we could talk about that for a long period of time. Um, I do think there is this question around what is appropriate data to give up in an environment like this? And how should that be done? And who governs how the data should be done? You get companies like Apple and Google who are collaborating in, I think, actually a pretty reasonable way. Um, I read some of the papers on it, and I feel fairly confident about it. Um, that collects data in a certain way that could be helpful for things like contact tracing. And um, again, if someone gets sick, actually notifying people automatically, there's some good things from that. Um, you know, at the same time, if there's, you know, ironically, I, I might trust Google and Apple to do that more than I trust the US government. That's maybe my government specifically, depends on other governments. Um, but now maybe taking this back to the workplace and thinking about your company, right? So a lot of companies were proactive about having people work from home before it was even legally mandated, um, especially in the US. Um, I know that's the case just because we were pretty slow on a lot of things. Um, but I know a number of companies like, again, ourselves at Humanize included, we were, uh, again, about a week before um, Again, issue uh, sort of guidance was issued. Massachusetts, we did uh, our, our CEO did make the call to to move people uh, to home, and so I think there has been some some trust built there, at least in the U.S. At the same time, um, I don't think that it 
this should mean we're going to surrender more of our personal data to to companies as as things get back to it to a new normal. I really think that um, maybe initially there might be less of a worry about that because we've had to worry about frankly much more serious things, right? Like the potentially losing two percent of the global population is much more serious than us being worried about are we going to be served more invasive ads? Okay, like honestly. Um, however, there are all real concerns when it comes to our employers, right? In that they control our livelihoods, they control, our, you know, in the case of the U.S., even our our health directly in terms of the health insurance. And so, I, I do think that there. I, I hope there will continue to be skepticism around that kind of data and a healthy skepticism in that data can be helpful, and that I know companies are trying to use data today so that when they develop their move-in plans for their offices, they're doing that in a way that does protect health and does that um, intentionally and carefully, again, promotes the kind of collaboration patterns that do need to happen, right? And then I see that these two groups really need to work with each other face-to-face, -face, and that's not happening over things like email or chat. Um, and so I, I am going to move them back into the office first, but I'm going to spread them out enough, and I'm going to make sure that if people are getting sick in that group, Right? Can I quickly ratchet that back or change? How can I do these things? Those are very important questions, and there is no easy answers in terms of these trade-offs. Um, but I do think that um, the trade-offs aren't, I need to give my employer all my personal data all the time because it. it who cares at this point? I, I don't believe it's at that point. Okay, there we have another one. Also an interesting one. How will the manager profiles change when this is over and what should be the key assets uh, for those? That's it's a really interesting question because in, in some sense there's always been these dual dual roles that managers serve which have been conflated um, in that you get people who are very good at least tactically at their job in terms of managing tasks or the, the team itself um, to get to deliver something. At the same time, there's also this interpersonal aspect um, of an organization. And I don't just mean the dynamics within a team, but I mean the broader network in the sense that we have informal connections with different parts of an organization. And in a lot of cases, one of the primary roles of a manager is to help facilitate that, to realize, that, oh yeah, you know, I know we don't like, we don't report to the same people, but you're working on this thing and you should really talk to that person over there. Like that would be really good. It's not necessarily that a single person to be excellent at both of those things is actually quite rare. Now it's possible, it's totally possible. And we see in our data actually from a number of our customers that there are a small number of people who can do both of those things in terms of things like managing upward and having really diverse networks with you know, leadership, um, as well as having great networks with their peers and their teams that is possible, um, but it's a very small number of people. Um, and so I do think either you're gonna get people who um, start to be a lot more highly valued on sort of this informal side because we've had to be so much more explicit about that today and that is just so much more valuable. I mean, I can imagine for a lot of the people who are, um, you know, on this webinar has had an experience over the last, you know, number of weeks or, or months of something organizationally falling through the cracks just because, oh, we, we totally, this was totally a blind spot and we missed it. If we would have only talked to this person earlier, um, we would have saved ourselves, you know, a ton of time and I think that because we've had to be more explicit about it though people who are better at that are going to be incredibly even that much more valuable because we're still going to have a number of people work remotely and so people who have a good sense of that and who are proactive about creating those introductions and those links um, that's going to be really critical um, as well as people who are really helpful at their teams managing their time because time is you know, we all have more to do at this point. A lot of us are managing our child's education at the same time as supposed to be doing our day job, at the same time as, you know, keeping track of, uh, you know, relatives and friends and all these things. And so what we've even seen in our data, even in the past, is that uh, managers who've been able to batch their own time um, are just much more effective, and that's so much harder today. What I mean by that is, so whenever we get interrupted, our performance is lower and we know this and that means if you work on a task for essentially less than 15 minutes if you get it again if you get interrupted within 15 minutes you've essentially wasted that time great research by gloria mark out of uc irvine who's done tons of research on that um, i think 
and what we've seen is that managers who can do that themselves, who say, I'm going to schedule meetings, again, in, in big chunks, and then schedule personal time, for example, and then other big chunks, that's a lot more positive, like building that in um, and helping their teams do that. Um, again, I know I'm asking a lot of different managers, but I am suggesting that it might not just be one person. It could be that there are multiple roles that different people who are or called a manager fill for particular teams. OK, then we have another one. Is there any study? That's the, the good ones ask. <laughs> always, always, always start with that. Is there any study that looked into the potential positive impact on the relations between people when they are in a private environment in front of their computer, as they might share more from their personality than being in an all neutral office? Not exactly. There, There is research showing that, for example, having video on, especially in one-on-one -on -one calls, dramatically improves the dynamics of those conversations. What I mean by that is the number of interruptions, um, the tendency of a single person to dominate a discussion. Um, again, that flow is a lot better when there is something like video. In terms of the type of things that people share, there is a lot of work in general, that face-to-face -face communication, when possible, is a lot more positive in the vast majority of circumstances. Um, I can't say that's always the case. What I, I would posit that the tools we have today, again, there's not a lot of research on this. Um, the tools we have today are not very good at removing a lot of the biases um, that people just naturally form when interacting with other people, right? Like if you're, um, now again, I will say some of the positive things that have happened that might, again, this is just happening right now. Like the fact that um, people who work in very formal office environments who maybe they had to wear a suit before, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not <laughs> wearing a suit um, working from home. Like that's not happening. Um, I've seen some people do that, which is just bizarre. Like, why are you pretending? Um, but <laughs> I do think there has been some benefit in that in terms of companies being able to say what part of the culture they value. And in those sorts of organizations, I could see this having an effect in terms of humanizing the people who work with each other, enabling them to share things they could in a, in a more formal environment and what more formal meant back then is maybe different than what it means today. Um, so th there's a possibility, but again, I'd say there's not a ton of support for it. Um, it is an interesting hypothesis that is, is definitely worth looking into, though. OK, um, then we have another one. Could we have your vision about how companies that have between their strengths and keys of success, personal relationships with their customers and person personal interactions between the team members should transform into the new environment? I think, again, I mentioned this earlier, I, we really have to value those those interactions so much. And again, I was talking obviously a lot within companies, but with, with customers as well, um, obviously. And I think a lot of companies have somewhat, have valued that over time as they, they've seen, again, just hard metrics on why that matters. I think that helps a lot of people. I think people, if I would have asked who's participating here three months ago, do you value relationships with other people or with your coworkers, with customers? Everyone would say yes, pretty much. Right? The question is not, did you subjectively value it? It was that what, what would you do to make that better? If I asked you, if I asked the CFO of a big company, I said, OK, you say you value that. I want you to invest $100 million in making the headquarters a better place to work. Right, in making it so that the interactions are better. Would you do it? Right? That's a much harder discussion to have. Right? And I don't think that discussion is by any means easy today, but I do think it's an easier discussion to have. And I do think that the fact that increasingly companies now have metrics and analytics on here is what is falling through the cracks. Here is how people are working. Here is how different tools or um, wor a working environment can improve that. That does start to move the needle there. And so I think it's much more um, 
again, it's around the exact way that that interaction happens. Again, depending on the exact industry and your company, it's going to be different, right? So like my company, we work with very large enterprises, like those are our customers, right? And so our customers are, you know, executives at really big companies, right? And there's a certain way that we interact with them. And there's a certain way that I would like that to work moving forward, right? Like they're, you know, I have heads of real estate, heads of HR that are calling me up from our customers and they're asking, you know, me questions like this. And we're trying to talk about it in their context. You know, at the same time, if I was a consumer facing company and I had a million customers, which which I don't have, I mean, again, our, our target, you know, is like Fortune 1000. It's not, you know, 5 million people. And so if it is those 5 million people, I do think there's a very different, you know, rather for me, it's I got to form very deep relationships with these people. I got to help them understand, not just from our technology, what, you know, I want to help them obviously be successful there, but also just holistically, like I care about these people. And I really want to help those specific people be successful in what they're trying to do now. Now, ideally, we could do that with 5 million people, but it's a harder discussion to have. Um, at the same time, again, I do think that rather than sending out emails, I mean, every company's done this, right? We've all gotten these emails. Oh, I, we care about you and we want to help you. You know, my gas, <laughs> a gas station sent me that email. Like, okay, all, with all due respect to the gas station, like, I don't need that from them. There's a different relationship I want to have with them. And so I do think there's still been too much of a uh, a one size fits all approach where everybody is trying to say they care about me in the same way. And what I hope is that it's a lot it's a lot more customized and a lot more honest, right? That maybe my gas station does want to support me, but what does that look like? That probably just looks like them having some hand sanitizer next to you know next to the the gas pump so that when I you know when I load up on gas that you know, that I'm safer and, you know, maybe it's them waving at me and that's it. Like that, that is, that is enough. And that's actually really good. Um, and, and so I do think that, but it might be hard. Actually, what's important is it might be hard for some of those things to demonstrate to a company that immediately they're going to make money on it. And what I hope is that we increasingly appreciate that that is going to come from investing in those things that will come. And there are increasingly analytics that can help prove that. Some of it's what I do. Some of it's what companies that are consumer facing do. But that I hope that there is an appreciation that doing doing the right thing there um, is going to long term benefit um, society as a whole, but also um, these companies. OK, thank you. There's another one. Um, but are we not heading back towards authoritarian business and society structures? Mm. No, so it's an interesting. <laughs> Interesting question. I, I think there's there's certainly some, I, again, I can speak to the US. I think there's certainly some concerns about that, which might, I, I don't know, you know, connected to this, but maybe, uh, um, you know, not as much. As long as we have elections in November, you know, we'll see. Um, however, um, and so I do think there are concerns about that with government. I mean, to think there's some encouraging signs out of places like South Korea that just really demonstrate how do you have an election during a pandemic and did a great job there. Right. And even with things like data sharing and intense testing, just doing a fantastic job. And so I, I certainly think there's hope and I think that we will get through this as a global society. Um, I am concerned about a retrenchment to um, you know, things like restricting immigration or things like that, which are incredibly important for a whole variety of reasons. They're incre if you even don't care about it on humanitarian grounds or moral grounds, the fact that Immigration dramatically improves economies, like provably. And I, there's like companies will make more money and be more successful with more immigration, period. Um, so that's a concern. Um, in the terms of companies, I do think there is that concern. I mentioned earlier these these organizations that are installing these this, you know, again, screenshot software and things like that on their uh, employees' machines. Um, this has always been something with remote work that has happened, that has come up over time. That as companies, you know, adopt flexible policies and decide to let people work from home, oh, how do we know they're really working? The point of tech, that's not the point. The point is, are they still doing what you're paying them to do? It's not, are they on the exact website you pay them to do? And again, increasingly, it's about creating the right environment so the right kinds of collaboration happens. I am concerned that some companies are going to, because we've had to be very intentional about this interaction, they're going to say, well, that means I'm going to tell you exactly who to interact with and who to meet with because I know best. And even the point of our technology, it's not about that. It's that you actually can't know that. It's 
it's more about the overall structures, the idea that I do know that people in engineering need to talk to people in sales. I know that for this company. I can, you can prove it again if you have the data. Who exactly in engineering should talk to who exactly in sales? That is essentially impossible to know, right? And there's and I think the companies that go along that route, there might be some companies that do it. I actually believe very quickly they're going to fail, um, like literally fail um, as a company because it's it's incredibly ineffective. Um, that does not mean that I like that we should downplay the concern or that we should ignore companies that do that. Um, they do again need to be publicly shamed and punished legally and all those things. Um, but I do believe that, again, I don't believe this authoritarianism. I believe that companies that try to use data to value those human relationships and to promote them um, in a positive way, rather than trying to micromanage them, I think that will be successful um, and that we should be vigilant about you know, authoritarianism creep. Thank you. Um... I have a question about physical workspaces because the future of work and uh, now we're all on involuntary lockdown and we're all a part of a social experiment, I would say, um, on a great scale. But then we're, we're all going to go back to the offices. And um, what do you think is going to happen? Because companies have these big workspaces. They're not going to slash the, the offices in half. So what's going to happen to that physical spaces? Well, you, could all, you could almost argue that the opposite is going to happen in the sense that, I, again, I, and I can speak now because, again, I have heads of real estate from some of the biggest companies in the world who you know I talk to now on a weekly basis. So I, so I can actually tell you what some of these, not specific companies, but I can tell you what they're thinking. They're actually wondering if they have enough workspace because of, they're not going to move everybody back right at once. Okay? But... They want to make it easier for people to socially distance within the office, which means you need more space. And it's been interesting because obviously the trend in, in physical space, in workplace, has been to reduce space. Right? It's that, oh, no, you don't you don't need your own desk. You can share a desk with someone else. And I'm not saying that's never true. But of course, today, that's a lot more risky. If people are sharing workspaces, the amount you have to clean to make that feasible, it's a lot more. It's a lot harder. Um, Beyond that, I want people to be physically farther away from each other. You know, there's still going to be some interaction that you want to have happen in the workspace, but how do you enable that, again, in a safe in a safe way? That requires more space. And so, ironically, I actually do think this will lead to, in the short term, possibly an, an increase in the amount of space we have to work. Um, but I did, and I do also think it's going to make companies a lot more intentional about the workplace decisions they make. Organizations are very much follow the leader when it comes to how they design their workplace. Someone reads an article about what some cool tech company does and they say, hey, they're successful. We should make the same kind of workplace as them. And then they do it not even just for like a single location or their engineering team. They do it for everybody and finance is the same office as software developers. And, and that doesn't make any sense. What I am seeing is companies stepping back from that and saying, well, how actually do we need to work? Who actually needs to work with each other in person? How can we enable that with the workplace? And how can we try to change that over time as our collaboration needs change? That is really encouraging. Um, and so I do think you're going to see a lot more variety of spaces rather than just everyone in open plan. Well, maybe some people will still be like that. Maybe now there'll be some partitions up between people, although I sort of doubt that, uh, that that's that effective. Maybe some people will be more private offices. But I bet part of that is, of course, going to be based on the health impact. Part of it is also going to be based on the the actual consideration of how people work and Probably because I can see now, I can quantify. Here is the different groups you collaborate with, and I know that because you're on Zoom with them, you know, you're you're chatting with them, and I've actually measured that. And so I can say that when you move back to the office, here's what that should probably be like. And I might be wrong, but be willing, but saying that looks very different for this team than for that team. Um, and I and that is again another possible positive benefit that's come out of this in terms of maybe breaking the cycle of just following the leader and trying to have this flashy office that looks good in pictures but is actually terrible to work in oh that's a that was a that was a fantastic um response another one another question different one this time some companies have employed psychotherapists during lockdown the idea is to help workers to set new family order how to talk with your kids how to set borders understanding the family situation 
for increased efficiency. What do you think about this? I mean, that if for companies that have the financial uh, wherewithal to offer that, I mean, that's a fantastic thing to be able to offer. Um, you know, you of course want to make sure that uh, whatever services they're offering are also confidential, right? In that you don't want um, people providing those services to tell your boss, oh, hey, you know, this this person's having a baby, they're probably going to have to take, you know, two months off later, maybe you should fire them early. Like, not that that is likely to happen, but you just want to be very careful about that. Um, but I think it's an incredibly wise decision. Again, if you have the, if a company has the financial resources to do that, um, making your coworkers and your people feel safer, feel more secure, um, and just have their lives in order is going to help them do better work. Whether that is today or whether that is in a couple months, because if your if your your home life is together, it's just a lot easier. I mean, again, I can even give myself as an example, right? So my older son um, is autistic. And it's actually, this has actually been a really positive experience for him because there's so much more accessible to him online that's harder for him to do in person um, than he could do before, right? And so, but if he's like, when he was having trouble in school a couple of years ago, before we got you know him into a better situation, um, I mean, my performance at work was terrible. I mean, just terrible, right? And they could have given me the, you know, we could have created it at my company, it's even my company, right? Um, but we could have created the best work environment, you know, and we, and we certainly try to, um, but things could have been optimized by some magic machine in the work environment and I could have had the exact right tools and it wouldn't have mattered, wouldn't have mattered, right? And today that is magnified for all of us and certain people have it worse than others, obviously. And so I think that is just an incredibly great investment that the companies are making. Um, and whether it's a psychotherapist, whether it's just, I mean, Again, I don't know the exact right um, people that might be um, good to bring in, but I think thinking broadly about that and moving forward, realizing that these things are always happening. A pandemic magnifies them, but people have lives outside of work and understanding well, what support do you need? And maybe I'm your manager or I'm just a mentor or I'm a peer, but a company giving people resources to bear on those personal issues is a great investment in general. Thank you. Um, I've got a question um, in terms of, um, can we actually expect loss of productivity? Because you always say that direct personal interactions within teams um, make teams uh, high performing, which means the company in essence makes more money. So now that is gone and um, it's uh, gonna be a few weeks more probably in different places around the world. So do you think we can expect that such productivity loss and to what extent? Absolutely. I, I think it's, it, it is already happening and it's something that we even see our data from across our customers. And I, at this point, I have data from, again, hundreds of thousands of people coming in on a daily basis. And it is interesting because I can tell you, for example, at, at Humanize, I think I wrote a a piece about this a, a week or so ago, or maybe it's coming, I, I'd have to check, um, about even our own internal data. And it's been interesting that internally over the first few weeks of people working from home, actually our performance increased. And there's a couple different ways we measure that that I'll talk about more in the piece. Um, and, but after that, it started to, to drop again. And a reason for that is if you think about it, well, you probably know is different, different parts of an organization know for the next couple of weeks, what are the things that they need to work on, right? And they've sort of come to an understanding as a group, here's what we need to do. But then over time, little things like that start to break down and that you might still have your high level, you're still gonna have your high level goals um, and high level marching orders and you might be able to develop them. But then as you're trying to think of what are the next things we need to be working on, what's the next phase of this that is so much harder to do remotely um, and virtually, and I believe that is coming to bear. And you're starting to see that in terms of collaboration patterns. I will say the vast majority of companies were not as well prepared as we were, or is just because they got obviously our whole business is around collaboration and interaction. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about this and measuring this. And on this is now 30% of my day is just spent understanding and trying to measure that internally. Right. Um, 
That is not the case for most organizations. And so in most organizations, not only in terms of output, but in terms of collaboration patterns, you've seen some just again, it, it's not that people are doing things horribly wrong. It's that who, who are you going to call up, right? Someone who you bump into in the cafe in your office once a month and have a good conversation with. You're not scheduling a call with that person. That would be weird, right? Right. I, you know, but those are the kinds of interactions that over medium to longer periods of time really drive significant value for organizations. And I think there are going to be some long-term effects. Now, I do think those effects are probably going to be dwarfed by just changes in consumer consumption patterns. Um, I'm not an economist, but having read enough about that, I am betting that that is um, the line of the impact in the near term. I am curious if in a couple of years you'll look at the you know product releases or things like that, and they might not be quite as good, or they'll be a lot slower to come out than they you would have expected. And it's going to be knock on effects from things like this. OK, thank you. So another one. How do you think a company could assess, measure the efficiency of home working without the workers feeling too much controlled? Where is the balance? I really think that the balance and obviously I'm, I'm totally biased on this because it's part of it, <laughs> too. Um, at the same time, I think the balance is not looking at individual behavior again. As a company, you shouldn't care about what a single person is doing. You care about the distribution, right? So I want to see like are people 10% more effective as an example, right? But that is not about a single person. That's about did the whole distribution of time or work patterns move in one direction or another. I care about, okay, strategically, I need these teams to collaborate. Is that happening or not, right? That's what you care about. None of that is at the individual level. None of that is about things like content. And I really believe that common sense things, which again, go above and beyond things like GDPR, not looking at content, looking at data at the group level, um, being also transparent with employees about what you're doing. Here's data we're collecting. Here's what we're going to do with it. And I'm going to give you a guarantee, a legal guarantee that this is what we're going to do with it. I think those are all incredibly important steps to take. Um, not everyone takes all those steps. That's certainly what we do, at least at my company. But I do think that um, that is the appropriate way to to try to improve working conditions um, in the work environment um, rather than trying to be micromanaging and take the screenshots of people's computers. I think that is over the line and and really just ineffective and self-defeating. OK, um, one of the last questions, could you share any best practices on the um, virtual socialization mechanisms? Because you can yeah. either leave it freely to roam or you can try to schedule things and then yep. risk over scheduling so it's best practices yeah so <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about the the over scheduling thing first um you're probably going to over schedule at some point and the only thing is that if you feel like it's too much then you should change it um one of the ge generally important points is that even if you magically get things right in your work on a given week it's going to change by the next week. I mean, it could even change in a day. What that means is that you need to be really flexible about the way you're trying to do these things. There are a number of things you can do to try to promote socialization. At the same time, at some point, you probably might overschedule you know, or feel overwhelmed for a variety of reasons. And so then you or the organization needs to dial it back and then also ramp back up at different points. And I know that can be challenging having a fluid situation, but just realize that Saying something's the best practice. So for example, um, I mentioned we schedule virtual lunches. What we actually do is we randomly pair up um, two or three people um, to have virtual lunch groups. Right? And then they meet on their own and you have lunch with each other. It's hard, again, we do it once a week. You could probably do it two or three times a week. Um, but I would suggest making it, you could make it random or semi-random, but that's ideal because it's not people you're gonna talk with anyway. I will, of course, still have meetings and talk to the people on my team who I have reason to talk to. It's that I don't bump into people, you know, in the cafe space or another part of the office who I normally would. So making that random is really useful. Um, things like, uh, but again, actually, an important point there is that the group size is small. In general, if you get beyond three people, 
you can get to May before sometimes, but you don't want those informal discussions to be much more than that. Um, we do have things like virtual happy hour um, in my company, so once uh, once a week, and people can bring their kids and stuff like that. Like you don't have to drink alcohol. You could, uh, but you don't have to. Um, but you can bring your kids and stuff like that. Maybe maybe when you bring your kids, you want to drink alcohol. Um, but you know, you do things like that. Um, and those events are good, but when they involve larger groups of people, I wouldn't do too many of those. Um, they're still helpful to create a shared sense of community, but if your company is any sort of size, you, you no one's going to be able, everyone's not going to be able to talk. And you could even have an all hands things, or you can have smaller groups with breakout sessions. Um, but I would just suggest being very limited on a lot of the all hands social events and lean a lot more on these small pairings or, you know, whether that's a random lunch, whether that is having managers or, or leadership hold virtual office hours. And so we do that, for example, twice a week. Everyone on the leadership team has two once a week office hours where anyone can just pop into a predefined room and chat. Um, I think things like that are good. I think having uh, different managers, for example, make a list of here are six people you should talk to over the next month and then introducing people, stuff like that is good. Again, none of these are magic bullets. If you do one or all of these things, that is not going to solve your social problems. That will help. Um, but you know, beyond this, trying to break down which groups do we need to work with over what periods of time, can we schedule some of those things in advance? And they might be formal meetings, uh, but trying to do that and then just constantly adjusting based on either hard numbers, if you're collecting data on this, or just how you feel about it is really important. Thank you so much. So as we're almost out of time, the last question, and um, because when this is over is in essence a positive experience because we know this is going to be over. We are not sure when, but we're trying to bring yeah. out some positive inside of this. Drawing value out of this experience, could you tell us what do you see as some positive outcome of what has happened to us over the last weeks? I really think I've mentioned valuing human relationships, but I, I do think that we've been able to see not just our coworkers, but but other people across society as as whole people. It's fascinating to me that there, if you look at people who are on TV or just other well-known people, and they're all at home, and everyone's in the same boat. Those kinds of shared experiences are so rare. And that's incredibly valuable. The idea that everybody on the planet has gone through a similar experience, right? And again, a, a lot of it, again, for more fortunate people, it's been it's been easier than for others. But but that shared um, that shared moment will hopefully create better understanding between different groups of people. And will make it easier for us to to be ourselves and also to help our our you know, people we work with to help our neighbors be themselves right and to be able to talk with people who we um we might have talked to previously right but that it's a lot easier to have conversations from a couple meters away because everyone's in the same boat um, i was uh, just uh so here we're allowed i don't I don't know if where everyone's located. We were allowed to walk our we're allowed to walk our dogs here, and I live in a uh, not de super densely populated area. So I was out walking my dogs early this morning, and you know I walked by someone's house, and they were just sitting on their front porch, and we talked for thirty seconds. It was a pleasant conversation. Again, we were a couple meters apart, and I was wearing my mask, um, but I wouldn't have done that before. And it just was was just gone about my business. And, you know, maybe that's more of a U.S. culture, but I would say I've very much felt that here. Um, and I think it's a very positive thing that is sort of removed some of the social barriers between people. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we've reached the end of the hour. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a fantastic uh, experience to have you with us. And um, thank you for your insights. They've got a lot of value. And um, thank you to all the participants. Thank you for the questions asked. Thank you for the bravery. And um, I would like to invite you, Ben, and, and all our participants to the next webinar. We're doing this Thursday. Um, and our guest is going to be Vidi Ragnarsson from Iceland, who is apparently treat, being, tr being treating the COVID virus quite well. 
And as he's a champion of fair pay and equal workplaces, we're going to discuss um, why this situation has hit women much harder than men and what can we do for the future to create healthier workplaces. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Everybody take care. Stay healthy. <laughs> Thank you. Stay healthy. Thank you, everybody.